A huge thank you to Dollar Shave Club for sponsoring this video, especially since I'm going to be talking about a lot of death and murder and talking shit about a major company, which YouTube definitely won't be pleased about. Dollar Shave Club has you covered, whether it be in the shower, oral care, or deodorant for your nasty pits, but most importantly and obviously, they can help you get that smooth shave you've been looking for. And I'm not just talking to you bearded folk listening right now. When I mention that I use Dollar Shave Club, I often get comments like, hey, 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 you're a girl, you don't need to shave. But let me enlighten you, we get hairy too. Fix that today with Dollar Shave Club's Shave Starter Set, featuring their weighty handle and six high quality blades, topped off with a three ounce tube of their magnificent Dr. Carver Shave Butter to help you not get razor bumps on your no-no parts. Head over to dollarshaveclub.com slash rainbot to get everything you see here for just $5. And after that, the restock box will ship regular sized items at regular price right to your door. And remember, when you support the sponsors, you're also supporting independent creators such as myself. And with that said, on with the episode. So these days there isn't a genre or format that Netflix isn't looking to somehow infiltrate and dominate if possible. Paranormal reality TV that's comprised of interviews and actor portrayals has always been wildly popular. So of course, in October of 2018, Netflix decided to throw its hat in the ring with the simply titled Haunted. As the title suggests, it's supposed to be simple, straightforward, and exactly what people expect it to be. Only it wasn't. Keep in mind, the marketing for the show emphasized that these were true stories. I want you to keep that in mind. And yes, upon first watching the series back when it was released, I thought what many other people probably did as well. Of course it wasn't real. It would be silly to expect paranormal shows to be based in any kind of truth, even if you believe in the afterlife. At the end of the day, we suspend our disbelief for a bit of entertainment the same way we would when we watch any old horror flick. But here's where things go a bit sideways for Haunted. While most of these paranormal shows depict your standard I heard a spooky noise or I saw an apparition, things by the way that are ultimately harmless, episode two of Haunted goes way, way beyond that. For the record, the rest of the series is completely fine, harmless fun, just like any other show. But again, episode two is something else. First off, the title of the episode is The Slaughterhouse. Why? Because it straight up deals with a serial killer or killers, depending on how you look at it. Again, when it comes to paranormal reality TV, the shows depend on the user suspending their disbelief, which is kind of hard to do when you're basically straying into true crime territory. You're probably wondering what serial killers have to do with ghosts, and I'll get into that a bit later. First, however, let me tell you a bit more about the episode itself. So right off the bat, the episode's description explains to us that it's about two sisters who grow up scared and alone in a real life house of horrors where their sadistic father does unspeakable things. Again, sounds a lot like true crime, doesn't it? The episode opens with yet another reminder that what you're about to witness is a retelling of a true story. Not that it's based on a true story, no, no. It straight up says that it is a true story. We're brought into a room where a group of people sit in a circle, almost support group style. This being the sort of visual trademark of the entire series, which I'll admit is better executed than most similar shows. We're introduced to Terrilyn, who opens up by explaining that her and her sister Sadie, also present, grew up in rural upstate New York back in the early 1970s. Terrilyn emphasizes just how secluded they were, telling us that neighbors were few and far between. The reenactments begin with young Terrilyn and Sadie sitting on their living room floor, rolling an orange back and forth, apparently per the command of their weirdo parents for whatever reason. Of course, the reenactment depicts their childhood home as way too dark and for some reason lacking electricity because damn near everything in this episode is lit by candle. Terrilyn also mentions how their home was built on Native American burial grounds because that's something that just every episode of a show like this has to mention. This, by the way, is never talked about again. Anyway, it's explained to us that the sisters were made to play the orange game, as they called it for hours, lest they experience abuse at the hands of their father. Already, we're made to understand just how sadistic this man really was and how guilty their mother was for not intervening. As we cut back to the interview section, it's revealed to us that the other two women in the room are Terrilyn's friends, Tracy and Carrie, but they don't really contribute much, so you can pretty much just forget about them. The lone male in the room, however, is Sadie's son, making him our main narrator's nephew. Terrilyn continues with her story, now telling us that her and Sadie's father would, on occasion, bring home what he called strays. People who had no families, nowhere to go, no one looking for them. The reenactment depicts a stray duo, one male, one female, presumably dating. Mom and dad decide to booze them up and have some 
I guess what counts as fun in a dark-ass house in the middle of nowhere with two old people, which I guess is playing the piano badly and dancing around in the living room or whatever. Okay, so at this point, when I first watched this, I was seriously curious as to where the hell this sequence was going, and I kind of figured that maybe the two strays would see something spooky, probably something related to the supposed Native American burial grounds, and then the asshole dad would, like, get mad at them or something and kick them out. Something like that. But no. The dad straight up strikes the chick in the back of the head with some kind of blunt object before she drops to the floor screaming. We cut away to young Terrilyn hiding in her room upstairs while the screams and banging sounds continue. Not to keep cutting away from the story, but by this point I figured, okay, this must be a dream, probably a nightmare brought about by the supposed haunting happening at the house, some kind of night terror, something like that. But nope, this shit kept going. We cut back to the living room once again where dad is now literally dancing with the woman's corpse while her assumed boyfriend is tied up and being made to watch this. And yes, mom is still involved and actively participating. Skipping over to the next morning, young Terrilyn heads down to the basement where she supposedly finds the bodies of the two people who came over to visit the night before, which confirms yet again that this is not a dream and this actually happened. Following this, Terrilyn explains that any time these so-called strays would come over, the next day always came with a visit by their dad to the surrounding woods, implying that that's where he ultimately would dispose of the bodies. She adds that her father liked to brag about what he did, even going as far as to give their family home a nickname. The slaughterhouse. Anyway, eventually Terrilyn's friend Tracy asks why the two sisters didn't reach out, figuring that they couldn't do to threat of violence by their shitbag father, which is exactly what it turned out to be. Jacob, again Sadie's son and Terrilyn's nephew, chimes in, adding to the profile of the man that was his grandfather. He supports the claims that his granddad would brag about murdering people and also adds that the man would try to groom him as a child by making him stab animal carcasses and weird shit like that. Jacob closes by saying that there are places on the property that he would never dig. Okay, so from this point on, I'm just going to skip around a bit for the sake of time and just narrow things down to the main story beats. We get a time jump to eight years after the initial setup. Terrilyn and Sadie are now teenagers, and they explain to us that while they were technically raised Catholic, their dad practiced, quote, his own religion. And here, folks, is where the paranormal elements of the story finally come into play. There's no way to lead into this, so I'm just going to say it. The sisters reveal that their father was a devil worshiper and that they believed he killed people because he was possessed. Yeah. By this point, I was pretty done too. After this, we get a typical possession scene where Father Evil is said to have growled or something like that, and from then on, things apparently somehow get worse. They get noisy, the phones would go dead, and lights would flicker inexplicably. Because, you know, all of these things are definitely worse than innocent fucking people being murdered in your family home. Terrilyn eventually escapes the slaughterhouse following a particularly bad altercation with her murdering-ass dad, and from there, it seems that the two sisters lose contact with each other for quite some time. We get a 28-year time jump, bringing us much closer to the present day. They explain that Psycho Dad is now dead, I expected from old age, but nope, Mom smothered the dude in his sleep and claimed the house told her to do it. They tell us that at this point they move Mom in with Sadie, and soon after Jacob was on the scene to start cleaning out the property. While doing so, he claimed to have found what he described as hundreds of his grandfather's trophies, which of course is something typical of serial killers, sure. But did Mr. Jacob turn in this possible treasure trove of evidence over to police? I went in and threw everything out that I could think of. Following this, Jacob moves in, proceeds to hear footsteps and blah blah spooky blah blah, he gets in contact with his estranged Aunt Terry, as he calls her, and she comes over to confirm that Jacob isn't crazy and they both experience spooky shit together, yada yada. The episode closes with Terrilyn and Sadie trying to reason with Jacob about what to do with the house, eventually leading Terrilyn to suggesting to simply burn it down before Sadie interjects, saying that fire isn't strong enough to kill whatever's inside. Again, I watched the show back when it aired in 2018, right around Halloween, and like I said before, the other episodes were for the most part harmless. None of them really made as outlandish claims as episode 2 did, so I found it a bit odd that it was even included. At the time, I didn't bother looking much into it, but since October is here once again, I got curious as to what happened with Haunted, more specifically the Slaughterhouse. Maybe the show was completely scripted, but meant to be sort of like the Roanoke season of American Horror Story, where they use the paranormal reality TV format as a gimmick. Again, no. 
It turns out that everyone else who watched this when it came out also had issues with episode two and actually reached out to the series producer who doubled down on saying that the events that took place were 100% real. He and Netflix swear up and down that Haunted is not scripted. So what do I have to say about this? I don't necessarily believe that everything about the episode was made up. I'm of course not talking about the more outlandish claims of devil worship and possession, but it's entirely reasonable that this family genuinely was dysfunctional and suffered abuse at the hands of their wacko parents. Keep in mind, a lot of this took place while the sisters were children, and I can absolutely see a world where harsh abuse in a toxic environment could lead them to believing what they were saying, especially if the dad was an asshole who liked to go around telling everyone how he killed people when maybe he didn't. Extreme trauma and stress do weird things to your head, and if the story wasn't completely made up by the show, then I can get why the girls were afraid to speak out against their parents. Most children are. For me, things start to get really messy the more you get towards the present day, because technically speaking, after a certain point, this family, that being Terrell and Sadie and Jacob, are technically covering for serial killers, plural if you include mom in this. Speaking of mom, they explain that after she killed their father, they moved her in with Sadie. Did they ever tell police how their dad died, or did they technically illegally hide that from authorities? That combined with Jacob disposing of evidence really means that these people are technically no longer victims and are actually admitting to covering up for their parents' crimes. The series producer, of course, decided to address this, claiming that prior to the series premiere, they were required to report what they were told to authorities and have not heard back. They also add that since the case is ongoing, the police are unable to comment, which is convenient for them. What makes this even more convenient is that the case is literally never going to be solved, and that's if Netflix actually did contact authorities. Why? because the location and era, along with the fact that the family supposedly threw away all the evidence. Keep in mind, this was said to take place in rural upstate New York beginning sometime in the early 1970s, the so-called strays mostly being people passing through, the initial pair portrayed as tourists from Europe, for example. There are a lot of missing persons or cold cases during and around that time period, and that provides a lot of verified noise to insulate the unverified claims. Without the evidence or bodies, there just isn't much hope of anything being solved. Now, with that said, however, if there are actually as many victims as the family claims, then finding the body shouldn't be that impossible of a task, especially given that the property apparently still belongs to them and is only about two acres wide. I could go on about this, but let's focus more on the show again for a second. While doing my research, I found this very, very interesting verified post on r slash paranormal. Hi everyone, my name is Chad and I am a producer working on season two of the Netflix docuseries Haunted. We reached out to the r slash paranormal community to source the first person experiences for season one and wanted to thank all of those who shared with us. We're looking for people who have had multiple experiences to include in season two. If you have experienced several extraordinary, powerful, and frightening first person encounters with the paranormal and would like to share it with us, please post it here or link to a post you already made. Our producers will be reading stories daily, and if we can help share your experience, a member of the production staff will reach out. So with that said, it seems that Netflix was telling the truth about the show not being completely fabricated, at least not by them. The stories are true in the sense that they did come from real people. Of course, and like I've already said a few times before, ghost stories are ultimately harmless, and whether or not they actually happen doesn't affect anybody today. No one hoping for closure, no one hoping for justice, no one hoping that maybe somewhere out there their missing loved one might still be okay after all these years. I think that the main issue that people took with Haunted, and more specifically the Slaughterhouse episode, wasn't necessarily that it was most likely fake, again, you kind of expect that with these shows, but it was really the clumsy way in which something as serious as a real life serial killer was handled. Going back to the aforementioned tweet thread by the series producer, he explains that unlike say making a murder, Haunted isn't an investigation show and he's absolutely right. At the end of the day, let's face it, paranormal docuseries are reality TV meant to entertain us and honestly cheaply at that, and I'm saying that as someone who enjoys them from time to time. What Haunted is not is true crime or the news, so when it very outlandishly steps into such territory with an unverified story, which keep in mind, emphasize its authenticity in its introduction, then you can't be surprised when people start asking questions, especially in the internet age. And you really can't be surprised when they call you out when you decide to double down in your bullshit. To make matters worse, if this story was true, at least as far as the murders go, there's still something slimy about Netflix allowing what's really a true crime story to be presented in such a sensationalist fashion on a show with no credibility, where an otherwise important story would be sent out to die. 
Most, including myself, assume that during the casting, the producers thought this was just too good of a story to pass up, of course, assuming that their audience was stupid, and decided to run the story despite they themselves knowing that they couldn't verify it, which they probably ultimately didn't feel the need to do anyway, otherwise this episode would not have aired. As for what happens next, I'm not sure. Halloween is fast approaching, and so is season two. Will it shamelessly venture into true crime territory once again? Who the fuck knows? Thank you so much for watching, and again, thank you to Dollar Shave Club for sponsoring the surely demonetized video, and a special thanks to Patreon supporters Matt, Mark, Shadow, Danielle, Jay, Garth, and VHS Squid for the added help. With that all said, I'll see you all again soon.